got the right press and prepare it too. Always like to check that. Um, especially, we, we like to use this as a little bit of a teaching opportunity too. We don't want to just take this catechism as rote, right? We want to see where do these things come from, especially for those of you who are newer in your walk with Christ. We don't want to assume these things. Rather, we like to take a few minutes to see what does the Bible actually teach us about these things before we confess these things together. This week, we're asking the question, what is God? And this reminds me a lot of when my kids like to ask me, why? It's a short little question that demands a really big answer but we'd like to keep this a short teaching time. So I'm going to slightly change the focus of the question, not just answering the whole big, vague, what is God, but focusing on what makes God uniquely God. After all, in Isaiah 45, verse 5, God directly states, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. So the testimony of the Bible is that God, Yahweh, is the only God. But what sets apart God from everything else? Why can't I be God, for instance? Specifically, then, I want to look at what attributes make God distinct or one of a kind. When we talk about the attributes of God, though, before we just dive into this sort of thing, I think it's important to focus on the fact that God's not just one part love, one part holy, one part merciful, as though it's some divine recipe. Uh, God is fully God. If we want to put this in fancier theological terms, we would say God is not a composite, not made up of or composed of a few things or different things. He is simple. He's one kind of stuff. So God's not a composite, but simple. Uh, as an analogy then, rather than a recipe, a better analogy when we're thinking about the attributes of God, I think are facets carved into a gemstone. Each facet's a little window, and it catches the light that passes through the gemstone, and it shows us what's inside the gemstone. Each facet gives us a slightly different view of the same gemstone stuff. The facets are not the gemstone. They let us catch glimpses of what that gemstone is like. The same thing with the attributes of God, then. They show us what God is like, but they are not the things that make up God. They are things that let us see who God is, but God is still just God. So... Diving in then to our attributes of God, first, God is revealed in Scripture to be triune, that is, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet one God. This is a profound and honestly confusing doctrine, and it's so much so that it actually will get its own responsive reading next week. So I'm not going to dive too much into this, we'll elaborate on it next week, but I do want to highlight how this shows up in many of the following points I'm going to bring up, that God the Father is God. God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. So we can look for and will find God's unique attributes revealed in all three persons of the Godhead. So, leaving at that, God alone is triune. What else sets God apart as distinct? Well, the Bible begins in Genesis 1-1 by saying, God created the heavens and the earth. And likewise, in John 1 verse 3, we read of Jesus, how he, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So God alone is the creator of all things. Everything else in the universe, us included, right, humanity included, is God's creation. God is uniquely the uncreated one. Likewise, Hebrew 1 verse 3 explains that Jesus, who is God, upholds the universe by the word of his power. That is, God is uniquely the sustainer of the universe. So God alone is the creator and the sustainer of the universe, right? Okay, what else? Well, many other verses reveal God to be infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Starting in Revelation 1.8, we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, right? Almighty there meaning God is all-powerful or infinite in his power. Another passage would be Psalm 102, verses 26 and 7, which say, the heavens and earth will perish, but you, speaking of God, will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away, but you are the same and your years have no end, pointing to God being eternal. Also Psalm 90 verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Right? These passages reveal God alone as an almighty, infinite in his power, as unchanging and unchangeable, and as eternal. Okay, these are things that, again, set God apart as distinct from us. What else? The last thing I'm going to bring up here is that God is also sovereign over his creation. 
First Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16 describe God as he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. So God is the only sovereign. He rules over his creation. He is the king over all kings, the Lord over all lords. Jesus' disciples even recognized that when they saw Jesus uh, calm the storm, he says, they said, he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Right? Even creation obeys his word. And Job, responding to God, declared, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Right? But with all these things, I don't want us just to have you know, some trivia knowledge that we can bring up. There usually needs to be some sort of application to this, Right? And it's important then for us to consider, like, no purpose of God can be thwarted. Okay, what has God purposed? I want to focus on what uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, starting at verse 3, where he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in earth. So because God, who created us as we're going through these things, right? God is unchanging and he's almighty. So we know he's not going to change. He's not going to change his mind about the promise he's made to us of salvation, of adoption, of future glorification through grace or by grace through faith in Jesus Christ he can and he will fulfill his promises to his elect. And no one can thwart or stop God, because he alone then is worthy of our trust and indeed of our very lives. So at this point then, I'm going to invite you to join me in confessing the words of the Catechism by standing. I'll read the question at the top, and I invite you to join me in reading the answer beneath. So what is God? God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. I'll just take a moment here to pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider who you are, it is important that we again remember how you are distinctly set apart from us. You alone are God. Let us not try to make you smaller than you are, as though we can somehow stick you in our pocket or control you or somehow bend your will. You alone are God. You alone are sovereign. You alone then rule over your creation, and no one can stop or thwart or bend your will or purposes. And Lord, I pray you would help us not to see this then as something oppressive, but rather as something glorious, something lovely and merciful, as we realize that not even our stubbornness, not even our sin can thwart your purposes. Thank you for your great love you've shown us through Jesus, your Son. And I just pray, Lord, as we continue to bring ourselves under the preaching, the, the teaching, the singing of your word this morning, that you would draw our hearts close to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so at this